already I can tell it's very similar. I'm gonna get it down to the I feel like it's not the same glass roof design. Also, if you don't believe we're in Arizona, Then we're going to head down 55 steps, 35 feet underground, to level two of the complex. First area is the blast lock. I'm going to show you what we built, the reason we built it. Then we're going to head into the control center. We're going to launch the missile. At least we're going to simulate the launch. <laughs> we're going to go through the exact same sequence and steps we would have gone through had we been ordered to launch this thing. Um, after that, we'll go down the long cableway and we're going to take a look at the missile. We're going to get up close to it. When they deactivated the Titan program, they destroyed all but 14 of these missiles. Those 14 were sent back, refurbished, and used to launch satellites into space. This missile never had propellant on it, never had a warhead. It was the 10th one off the assembly line. We used it to train on. Uh, they didn't need it, gave it to us, comes in three pieces. First stage, second stage, reentry vehicle. Lower it down with a crane, bolt it all back together. The only place on Earth you can see a liquid fuel rocket back in its natural habitat where it belongs. It's the biggest missile America ever built. It has the biggest warhead we ever put on a missile. If you take every single bomb we dropped in World War II, including those two atomic bombs we dropped on Japan, every bomb our allies dropped in World War II, and every bomb our enemies dropped on all of us in World War II, double it. You're still not what this thing is. That's how big this thing is, how devastating it is. Nine megatons, nine million tons of TNT it's equivalent to. The whole idea of this, as odd as this may sound, was peace. Our main goal was peace. Peace through deterrence. Mutually assured destruction. The theory is, if no one can win one of these things, no one will try to win one of these things. The 54 Titan II's with the nine megaton bomb ensured Mutually assured destruction. If the Soviets launched a sneak attack against us, we would retaliate. It was strictly retaliatory, not a first strike weapon. And we would ensure that we would destroy, completely destroy their country if they tried. We weren't necessarily even built to fight World War III. The Titan II was built to scare the Soviets into starting World War III. Security! Nine megaton bomb! You think this place would be crawling with security? We had two people, they drove around in a jeep like that. They would only come here if we called them. There were no television cameras up here like you see in the movies or anything. All we had is if you look behind you, that little silver pole with the scoop on it, just two of them guarding our air conditioner. There was no air conditioner either. Just an air shaft with an open grate. That's all the breathable air we had. We didn't want someone throwing something in there trying to kill us. So we guarded that and there's eight more guarding our door. It's called the Tipsy 39. It's just a Doppler radar, early form of a, a security. Just like what opens the door at the supermarket for you these days. You cross that radio beam, we get an alarm, we call these guys. The last piece of the security puzzle is the way we enter. It takes a series of four phone calls to gain access to the silo. The blue box at the gate is our first call. Hi, we're here, let us in. We have three minutes to make it to this next phone. If you can't do it in three minutes, you're not getting in. And that was for our safety. We drove out here. We could have been attacked, infiltrated. We could have a gun to our head. They didn't want anybody having to give a distress code. So what we had to do was slow down. Just drag our feet a little bit. It takes more than three minutes. The bad guys aren't getting in. And you know help will be on the way. Let's go down. Alright, 35 feet underground. Even a bomb 15 miles away is going to completely destroy everything up top except that door in this area. The only way in is our way out. Where you guys are, the harder part of the structure is going to protect us from the radiation, from the blast wave, the heat wave. The electromagnetic pulse, that's a pulse of energy, shoots out from the detonation. It's the speed of light. It's going to fly anything electronic. There's going to be no more video games, television, telephone, 
automobiles, electricity, period. Back in the dark ages. Never going to work again, probably. Living by candlelight. Rise of it. And this is going to protect us from all that as long as that bomb that the Soviets drop on us misses us by more than a mile. If they can land it within a mile of this spot, we'll be instantly vaporized. We don't even know what hit us. Nothing can survive one of these things. I'll explain why a mile is the number as we go. We made our second phone call from upstairs. Outside that door, they buzz the commander in. He reads off a code, lights it on fire, burns it, throws it in that red can on the wall, and they buzz him into here. We make our fourth and final phone call from this phone. We hit this button on the wall, just like this one, and someone in the control center hits the same button, and these four pins will be trapped. And then we can manually open up the door. Four of these doors, glass door six and glass door seven, protect us from that near miss. Glass door eight and glass door nine protect us from our own missile. Either the line with the missile or an explosion with the missile. Now, once these are retracted, we manually open up the door. It just hung on two hinges with ball bearings. They've never been adjusted. They were put in a quarter inch off the floor. They're still a quarter inch off the floor. That's how well this place has been built. Nothing moved. Uh, it's up to the lowest person or the youngest person on the crew to manually open and close all the doors. Today is your job, sir. Can you help me? Come on. Right over here. Two hands. And just lean back and give it a tug. Is it heavy? Yeah. Can you read how heavy? 6,000 pounds. There you go. 6,000 pounds, boss. Well, Keep these doors. Anybody tells you you're not strong, you flash that car. <laughs> Uh, control room? Yeah. yeah, this is really cool. There's a bench here if anybody would like to sit. Come on all the way in. You can stand up here with me. You can fill in these blocks over there. Want to sit? All right, we're in a three-story building. Round on the top, flat on the bottom, and that's going to deflect an overhead blast away. The top floor is the food court, the airport, the mother's fancy. Bunk bed, kitchenette, bathroom. Downstairs is the equipment bay, that's where all our power communications come to. This is launch control. This is where we launch from, this is where we spend most of our time. The last thing we have to worry about is the shock wave created. This is going to be an unimaginable earthquake. It's going to make the land above our heads look like waves on the ocean. We need to withstand that. Everything critical to launching this missile, the people, the equipment, and the missile itself, are all on shock absorbers. Therefore, shock is shock You're going to see them everywhere as you walk through here, including all three floors of this building. You cross the bridge to get into this room. We're just hanging here, suspended by eight of these massive springs around the room. So in case of that shock wave, the ground around us in the shell of the building can all move a foot and a half up and down and a foot side to side and we should just hang here and not feel a thing. Now, the four people on the crew, we're here for the next 24 hours. That's our ship, what we call it an alert. It's our job down here to keep this missile in a state of readiness at all times. Monitor, troubleshoot, decode any secret messages. That's our job. The first person on the crew is the commander. The commander's going to be a captain sometimes a major. They're responsible for us, the complex, and the missile for the next 24 hours. And they have the weight of the world on their shoulders. It's up to the captain here to make sure that that order comes through, that we actually go through with it in line. Now we go through extensive psychological testing every week, every day, with meeting with those psychiatrists to make sure the four people down here are stable enough and willing to launch this thing. But there's always go. The two of us wear weapons. If one of us decides, if one of us decides to try to stop the others from launching, we're going to eliminate that person. We're going to drag them out of here. We're going to continue on with what we're supposed to do. You're the deputy commander. You're learning to be a commander. You're in charge of all our radios. Four radios connected to seven antennas upstairs. Uh, all built in redundancy. If you can't get the message to launch, would have been a big waste of time and money down here. If a problem arises, it's our job to figure out what went wrong. We're going to troubleshoot it. 
Then we're going to call the base, Davis Martin Air Force Base. There were 450 dedicated maintenance people, specialized in all aspects of these silos. They would fly them out on helicopters, and they would fix any problems we have, keep us in a state of readiness. You're the safety officer. It's up to you to keep track of where they are out there on this board. In case someone has an accident, or we have to launch. You cannot launch if people are working out there. They are not going to survive that. you got to get them in here. And you got to get them in here in a hurry. Your main job, though, is taking care of our clock. Now, no wire is going to it. It's an AK wind-up phenomena. Electric clocks are not reliable enough for our needs. This clock has been running since 1963. It just, we wind it every Sunday morning, and then twice a day, every day, it's hacked with the atomic clock of Boulder, Colorado. Your clock can never be more than one second off. This is our launch clock. Our launch clock is set to Zulu time. Zulu time is seven hours ahead of our lunch clock or our local time. Anybody know what Zulu time is? When it's meantime. The zero meridian where the time zone starts. We use it, our allies use it, and the space station uses it. It avoids confusion during military operations. The deputy here, the captain, doesn't have to call and go AM, PM, daylight savings time. Like last night, would have messed everything up, right? We did away with all that. Zulu time right now is 1,720 hours. 1,720 here, Australia, Europe, all over the world. Everybody knows exactly what time it is. The last two people are the enlisted people. We're the workers down here. We're the most technically trained people. We went to school twice as long as the officers did. We had to learn all aspects of this place. The first enlisted person is the missile facility technician. They do just what it sounds like. They take care of the facility. They're going to keep us alive down here. They're going to keep that missile happy. Nine floors out there jam packed with anything you can imagine a missile may need. Hydraulic, pneumatic, water, sewage, air conditioning, heating, power. They're going to control all that stuff from right here. It's their job to make sure this complex is 100% 100% of the time. The last person on the crew is the BMAT, Ballistic Missile Analyst Technician. The electronic technician. That was my job down here. My responsibility is to make sure this missile will launch. I'm in charge of all the electronics. All the launch equipment, the missile itself, the guidance system, and the warhead. Now, I can't ever try this. I can't start it. If I start it up, I start in World War III. But from here, I can test everything. I can go through a simulated launch like we're about to do. I can make sure everything's in working order. I can even open the 760 ton door. Make sure this thing's going to work if that day ever can. A couple of the panels. This is the enunciator panel. That's connected to that Doppler radar up there. If this alarm goes off, we call the base. They send out that two-person crew. We never go outside ourselves. Once we're in here, we're in here. We're not going to open up the door and let some enemy in here. They'll come check it out. They're never more than 20 minutes away. And in the 20 years, all these 18 silos were active down here. They never found an intruder up there. There was never an attack. It was just either a rabbit or a bird setting those things up. This panel is the butterfly control valve lock. A couple of years into the nuclear program, they realized that anybody could launch these things. Either a crew that went crazy down here, a crew that had been infiltrated, or even accidentally, they had to come up with something. So they put this combination lock in. That's connected to these. This is the cutaway of a butterfly valve. There's four of them on the first stage engines. Two for the fuel lines, two for the oxidizer line. It's a hypergolic reaction. Hypergolic means explodes on contact. You don't need an igniter, a fuse, or a spark plug to light this thing off. When the fuel touches the oxidizer, it instantly explodes and this thing takes off. One of them has a locking pin connected to this. The only way you can ever launch this is to get that to retract. If you go try to do it manually, it will explode and melt together, the missile will never move. The only way to ever open it is to put the correct combination in. We don't have it, the base doesn't have it, the Pentagon has it. You only ever see this combination if we actually get the real order to launch this thing. Now there's 16.7 million possible combinations. You gonna guess that? No. No, absolutely not. <laughs> and if you try, on the sixth try, this thing's gonna melt down. Never to work again, we're no longer in a state of readiness. 
you guys are going to call the base. Worst phone calls of your career. You're not going to be officers of the United States Air Force tomorrow, I guarantee you that. <laughs> All right, typical day of work for a crew. At 6 in the morning, we meet at this top secret bunker on Davis Montana Air Force Base in Tucson. We go down in the bunker, and they give us a briefing. And they're going to brief us on anything a missile crew should know about that day. Troop movement, military buildup, uh, new weapons from our enemy, political problems around the world. And then the last 10 minutes of every meeting, they would show us movies they got from the Soviets of them detonating their largest nuclear weapons. Put us in the mood for the day. It was like that for our job. We jump in our trucks, we drive out to the 18 silos, we replace the crew that was here, they take our truck, they go back to the base, and we seal ourselves in for 24 hours. First thing we're going to do is check everything. Everything up top side, all three floors here, all nine floors out there, everything. It takes four hours. And then 12 hours later, we turn around, we're going to do it all again. Twice a day, every day, for 20 straight years, this place has gone through with a fine tooth comb looking for any problem. When we're not doing that, we're in here. That ate up eight out, eight out of our 24 hours. We have 16 hours left. You're going to see signs when you're walking through here. SAP, two-man policy, no loan zone. Y'all heard of the buddy system, right? This is the buddy system for nuclear bombs. One, safety, yeah, two, trust. I'm watching you. You're watching me. The four of us, eyes on each other. If you go back there, I'm going with you to see what you're up to. We can't have anybody sabotaging this, trying to steal and sell our top secret information to the Soviets, or worse, they broke up with their husband or wife that morning, they don't care if the world ends, so they're going to give it a little push. Can't have that. We watch each other all the time. Always have to be one officer and one other person in this room at all times. For 20 years, there was always two people in this room. And two people have to be together when they walk out there and look at the missile. The only place we could be alone is up in the cruise port. We had four hours each day. You could go take a nap, get something to eat, just get away from the stress and the tension of this room. Maybe read a book or whatever. Now, say it's 3 in the morning. We've been here for 20 hours. We're sealed in. There's no radio, there's no television, there's no news from the outside. We're kept in the dark here. We don't know anything that's going on in the past 20 hours. Anything could be happening up here. All we know is what's going to come through these two speakers. The top one is connected to Strategic Air Command Headquarters in Omaha, Nebraska. The bottom one is the 15th Air Force in Riverside, California. In case one of these bases has already been destroyed by a nuclear bomb, we'll get the message from the other one. If they're both destroyed, if Washington's already been destroyed, if the President's already been destroyed, then there's a flying command post. It's codenamed Looking Glass. We called it the Doomsday Plane. Every second of every day for 30 straight years, there were people in the skies over America safe for a nuclear attack they could give us the orders to retaliate against the Soviet Union and the coast we needed to launch this missile. Strategic Air Command is in charge of every nuclear bomb America owns. Doesn't matter which branch of the service. So when they send out a message, it goes out to all of us. It goes out to the Titan II missiles, the Minutemen missiles, all the bomber groups, and the nuclear submarines. It may be a test. It may be scram scrambling the jets. It might be a simulated launch. Maybe the real deal. You don't know. Every message starts out the same and sounds the same. Not until you decode it, you know what they're actually talking about. But I'll tell you, we're trained to believe. When you hear this noise you're about to hear, that means it's World War III. You better believe it. You better get over here. You better start working until you prove it's not. Now, this is an extremely boring job, folks. 12 hours a day in this room, staring at these lights and each other, punctuated by moments of sheer terror when you hear this. <laughs> They're going to read off a 41 character message. The captain has an emergency action book and so does the deputy. They have a grease pencil. They're going to copy down the message. Then they're going to exchange their books. They repeat the message. They're going to copy it down again. Then they're going to put their books together. <clears throat> Sorry. Make sure they copy down the same thing. It takes two people to agree to anything when it comes to nuclear weapons. Not even the president can do anything unilaterally. Somebody has to agree with them. 
If you both agree, you copy down the same message. We're going to decode this message, see what it actually says. Well, unfortunately, today, it's a message we've all been dreading. It's the real deal. We have been ordered to launch this thing. What do you think, folks? Think we can launch it yet? No. No. Who's the only person in America, as long as they're still alive, that can authorize nuclear war? Please. The president, right? The president of the United States. We have to make sure it came from the president. It's a radio. It could have been anyone. This allows us to go into that red state. That's our emergency war order thing. The most top secret document in America was kept in there. And that is our PSYOP, or our nuclear battle plan. The battle plan for every nuclear bomb America owns was, we're taking out that book. We're also taking out 24 of these authenticator cards. We're going to choose the one that corresponds with the first two characters in that message these guys wrote down. Say it's this one, Lima 5. These were made out of hot plastic. So we'd have to crack them open and we would pull out the cookie. It's been 40 years, I can't remember why we called it that. You look like a cookie to you? No. You know the guy calling around the president with the nuclear football, the launch codes? These are the launch codes. You two are going to put this next to those two books. Make sure it lines up exactly. If you both agree, that means it came from the president. It's been authenticated. We've been ordered to launch this thing. Now, the message itself is going to tell us which battle we're fighting. It all depends. There's all different scenarios depending on what the Soviets have already launched battle. We're going to go to that page. It's going to tell us what time to launch. You take your grease pencil and write the time on your clock so we don't make a mistake. This thing's going to be synchronized down to the second. We're going over the North Pole. There's 450 Minutemen missiles going over the North Pole. You've got submarines popping up from under the ice in the North Pole, and they're firing over the North Pole, and all the bombers are in the air. This thing's got to go exactly when it's supposed to go. That's why this clock has to be so accurate. It's going to tell the commander which one of our three pre-programmed targets we're aiming at, and it's going to give him the, the code to the butterfly valve. He reads it off to the BMAP, I put the combination in, flip this button, switch, hit that switch, we got a green light, that means we put in a good code, the butterfly valve are activated and have been unlocked, we're halfway there. We also know a couple other things. We know that if the president has ordered us to launch this thing, we have completely and miserably failed at our mission. Our mission of keeping the peace, peace through the terrorists, failure. There's no more deterrent, there's no more peace. We're at war. The Soviets have already launched. There's going to be nuclear weapons raining down on American cities within minutes. It takes 30 to 35 minutes for a missile to reach us here from the Soviet Union. It takes North American air defense in order to see the launch, verify the launch, get the President's Joint Chiefs of Staff together, figure out what's going on, how to retaliate, what we're going to do. Send out the messages to Strategic Air Command, 15th Air Force, the Doomsday Plane, and for them to broadcast the messages out to the Minutemen, the Titan Twos, the B-52 bombers, and the nuclear submarine. 20 to 25 minutes have passed easily. We have five minutes to live. If they can hit us. They only have to miss by less than a mile. So we need to launch. All right? You ready? <laughs> Where do we launch missiles in America with big red buttons, you think? Hollywood, exactly, Hollywood. You always hear somebody's got their finger on the button, right? He's just tell us that blast door the wide open. In the real world, we use keys. There's a set of keys in that safe. The captain inserts his key here. The deputy inserts his key over here. These keys are angled. They're seven and a half feet apart, so one person can't turn both. They're spring-loaded, like the uh, ignition in your car, to the off position. You can't turn one and go turn the other. They have to be turned at the same time. So you ready? Are you going to turn it for them? Turn it. And hold it. All right, you can let it go. You've done your duty. You've just joined World War III. There's no stopping this, folks. If the president calls now and says there was a huge mistake, too bad. There's no loose button. There's no self-destruct. This thing is going. The first light is launch enabled, it's checked all the equipment, everything's a go. The second light, batteries activated. There's two batteries on that missile being forced metal electrolyte for the first time. It takes 28 seconds to fill them. 
Once they're full, we get ABS power. That means it's on its own. It's creating its own electricity. Doesn't need help from us anymore. The next light is that silo stop. The big door just opened up, slid open, went through the tipsy, set off the alarm. The silo is wide open. The next light is guidance bell. The guidance computer on the missile is talking to this thing for the last time to make sure it knows what target it's going to, how to get there, what to do once it gets there. Fire engines, the butterfly valve has just opened up, the two fuels are mixed. This thing is lit up there, the silo's engulfed in flames. All the fire alarms are going off. When the missile gets to 77% of its full thrust, the four explosive bolts that hold it down explode, and the Titan II starts lumbering up out of the hole. And then two seconds after that, lift off. It's gone. We wouldn't have felt it or heard it down here. That's how isolated we are from that missile. 58 seconds, folks, that's all it takes. 58 seconds. The previous missile took 30 to 45 minutes to launch. So you would have to fill it up with fuel, raise it on an elevator out of the saddle, and then launch it. That made it vulnerable. It's not a good deterrent. This only took a minute. It only took three minutes from the time we actually got the message. That gives us two minutes to live, say our prayers, whatever we want to do down there, if they can hit us. The missile, however, is on its way. It's going to target two. You know where target two is? No. No, you don't. Neither did the crew. We had one of the highest top secret clearances you could possibly get from the American government to do this job. We did not have a need to know. Target two was top secret in 1963. It's still top secret today. Chances are something else is aimed at target two right now. They didn't want the crews to know because they didn't want to make this harder than it had to be. This thing can destroy 10 million people in a half hour from now. As a crew member, I can honestly tell you, we never even discussed it. We never talked about it. We never thought about it. We didn't want to know. All we know is what's going to happen when we get to Target 2. This thing's going 800 miles into space over the North Pole. Three times higher than the space station sits. It's going to hit its faculty, and it's going to start dropping down on the other side of the world, and it's going to drop down on Target 2. Target 2 is set in a ground burst. The ground burst is going to detonate right before it hits the ground. It's the original bunker buster. We're going to dig out a missile silo, command and control, maybe a bunker under the Kremlin, who knows. When it detonates, it's going to blow a crater in the earth instantaneously, three quarters of a mile wide, 450 feet deep, and it's going to completely vaporize anything that happened to be there. Not like it never even existed. Gone. Now, we could have been ordered to shoot it one or three, and change it from a ground burst to an air burst. The air burst is much, much worse. Air burst is retaliation for the Soviets starting this thing. The 54 Titan IIs are going to destroy 54 of the Soviets' biggest cities. This thing's going to detonate 14,000 feet above the land. In a millionth of a second, there's going to be a three mile wide fireball, 10 million degrees, brighter than 100 suns. 10 times the speed of sound, it's going to completely and utterly destroy 900 square miles of Earth. 900 square miles of Earth is a city 30 miles across. That's any city on the globe. New York, Washington, LA, Beijing, Moscow, anything. Completely gone. Everybody in it, completely gone. And then for miles and miles beyond that, there's going to be homes burning, fires raging, people dropping from the radiation. It's a devastating, devastating weapon. The Earth has never seen anything like this before. It's what America thought we needed to keep the Soviets at bay, to keep the peace. We never did it. We've never turned the keys. We haven't turned them yet. We never got the orders to turn the keys. For 24 years, the Titan II missile is America's biggest, baddest deterrent, and all the men and the women that served down here over the years did their duty. We accomplished our mission, our mission of keeping the peace, peace through deterrent. That's for you. Can you read what it says in red? Missile combat. No, just in red. Oh, I can. You turned the key, yes, you did. <laughs> you did your duty. You admitted it. You're on the hook for this thing. You better go see if it's still there. <laughs> it only costs two and a half million dollars. I don't know what your father's up for a job. <laughs> uh, you look up, that's the re entry vehicle. Uh, that's where the warhead would be kept. The one in the gift shop is a real re entry vehicle. The only thing to paint here is the bomb in the gift shop. We couldn't actually put a real nuclear weapon in the gift shop. So that's just a markup, but everything else is real. The missile's 103 feet tall, 10 feet in diameter, weighs 330,000 pounds. 
It has 430,000 pounds of thrust, equivalent to 2747. 2747 is in this little tube, which breaks this missile apart, it would never launch. So all those weird shaped gray panels along the inner wall, it's all full of spun fiberglass, like the muffler in your car. 1963, it was the world's biggest muffler. We also have a 100,000 gallon tank of water attached to the outer wall. That's going to start dumping water under those engines when you turn those keys. What do you create when you put fire and water together? Steam. steam. Yes, absolutely, steam. The energy it takes to create that steam absorbs all the sound waves, and the Titan II is the first system to be launched from under the ground inside a tube like this. Now, NASA loved this boat, this airframe. So they bought some of their own. They called it Gemini. Gemini Space Program, precursor to Apollo. Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon, you all heard of him, took his first ride into space on his uh, Titan II missile named Gemini 8. This was the launch vehicle for the Gemini series. Uh, we call it a missile because there's a bomb on it. You strap a couple people to the top and shoot it off, it's a rocket ship, like any other rocket ship. 1964, this was the biggest rocket America owned. Wasn't well, until the Satins came along that there was a bigger rocket. This thing was built to last 10 years. We got 24 years as America's biggest deterrent, and then another 16 years we used it to launch satellites into space. The two Viking missions to Mars in the 70s, they went up on a Titan. The two Voyager missions, one to Jupiter, one to Saturn in the 70s, they went up on Titan. The last launch of a Titan II was October 2003. We got 40 years out of this, out of this airframe. 40 years, that's unheard of in this industry. At a cost of two and a half million dollars a piece, which is unheard of too. We really got our money's worth out of this where the military usually doesn't. Back in the day, a lot of you people remember, like the first Tuesday of every month or something, they would test the air raid sirens. Usually you would train to run towards it. That's where the fallout shelters were. This one, do the opposite. If that thing goes off, you better get out of town because it means there's an imminent disaster waiting to happen right here. All right, folks, in order to become a museum, we made a deal with the Soviets. They also have a museum. It's in the Ukraine with a comparable missile, but they didn't put it back where it belonged. They just threw it on the ground, kind of. So we put ours back in. We opened the door halfway. We put these big blocks of concrete on the railroad tracks it rides on so they can see it can't open any further. Where the pyramid is, we put a glass dome over the open half. We cut a hole in the re-entry vehicle. So when their satellites fly overhead, even today, they can look down, peer in that hole, make sure we haven't put a bomb back in this thing and made it operational. Uh, so that's the perfect place to see this. Because uh, the sun's out, there's viewing stands on either side, put your hands right on the glass. Or put your camera lens right on the glass. You're going to see all 103 feet of the Titan too. After that, there's a shed with the engines. This thing's going 800 miles high. You would think these things would be massive. We all remember the space shuttle. You can almost put your arms around these engines. Incredible technology. You can go anywhere you want out here. Just stay within the fence. You can't go back downstairs. Uh, this plaque is explaining with everything. Spend as much time as you want. Trey, how was the tour? Unspecious. It was so awesome. We got a piece of a rocket at the gift shop. Well, it was a decent price, but this is so fun. I really suggest it for all of you people to come here. If you're in Arizona, stop by. Really nice employees, really nice people, and just, it's awesome. All right. Just south of Tucson. Great stop. <laughs>